Okay, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is a great meeting. It's a pleasure to be here and looking forward to the discussions. I also wanted to make a quick plug as editor in chief of GQ that the science you guys are doing that we're discussing here is exactly the kind of science we'd like to see represented in our journal. And we had conversations last night already about possibly doing a special section. And our special sections are very special in that when you publish a paper, it comes out right away. And there are other benefits, I think, of publishing GQ, which I'd be happy to discuss um, with you later if you're interested. The research I want to talk about today is uh, interdisciplinary work, and it's highly collaborative work. And really, I, I've done very little to contribute to the results I'm going to discuss today. And um, there's a number of people who've really contributed much more than me, starting with Claudio Jean Willard, um, who you know well, Enrico Cipolloni. And then there was a team of USC student faculty that was involved in the second part of my talk. And I'm going to want to focus on the Atlas. And so the general um, idea is to understand topography in the Mediterranean. And it's, of course, very close to the, the focus of Topo Europe. And it's indeed you know, the focus of Topo Europe. That's what I decided to talk about, um, the subject matter. And it's uh, a lot of people in the audience here know way more than me about the setting. But just to recap, we're sitting here at the, at the western end of the Tethyan collision, where there's a lot of action up here in Tibet. And uh, the smart people like Laurent have recently published really interesting work on what's happening here. Of course, this is where we have very large convergence rate, very large topography. And here, um, in the western end, we have this system where convergence is really slow. And we have these chunks of oceanic lithosphere left. But mainly, we have a continental collision system. And the Mediterranean is very nice for studying these interactions between oceanic lithosphere here, continental lithosphere, and understanding how the two modify each other and how subduction is reflected in continental lithosphere by means of um, forming weak zones and forming some sort of memory effect. So it's a very interesting place to study. Also, I happen to prefer the food here you know, compared to yak's milk or some crap like that. And so in terms of the scales, the Mediterranean is also really interesting because it has this mesoscale character. It, it should really be addressable with advanced imaging methods and advanced modeling, even coming in from the global scale. And I think we're, we're getting there in terms of representing global processes in a regionally realistic way. But it also allows us to explore those natural laboratories that Carolina nicely introduced because they're data rich. And so um, what I want to do is I want to zoom in into some of those regions, do very much what Carolina suggested one should be doing. But just on the, on the scale of the Mediterranean basin, we can look at some of those contributions to topography that we, um, that we talked about earlier. And so here is smooth topography. And you're going to see contours here of the actual topography now on the next map. The next map then is residual topography. And it's the residual topography that you can obtain by using a crustal model and taking out the crustal density variations and the crustal thickness variations. And here's what you have left over. It's one way of getting at the anomalous contribution of topography. And then, you know, the way I've done this here uh, is I have not taken out the effect of oceanic, of oceanic lithosphere. So we see plate tectonics at work here. Um, but we see some other features, such as positive topography over the, over the Western Alps, parts of the Apennines, part of the Atlas that, is, that I want to focus in. And that's interesting. Uh, here's another way of getting at residual topography, taking free air um, anomalies and filtering them to mid-wavelength and then just scaling them. And this assumes that you know, if there's any signal in free air gravity at those wavelengths, that means things are not compensated. right? And so. You know, there's some consistency here with where we find um, anomalies, such as in the Atlas, again, for example, or over Anatolia, which is nice. And uh, we can then compare that residual with predictions for mantle flow, right? If, if we correct for the crustal structure, lithospheric structure, 
what is left over um, should be governed by deep mantle processes. And this is taken, a seismic tomographic model, which has a regional model embedded here in a global model, and computing global mantle circulation, then looking at the tractions and scaling this to topography. That's exactly what Carolina did in, in her talk. And you can see, again, there are some places where there's an indication that the residual, say, from free air, is indeed similar to what we see from mantle circulation, so there's perhaps a deep mantle origin. And I think on a Mediterranean scale, it is useful to do this exercise, and we can learn something from it, but it's one of those maps, right, that you need to be kind of, you should put a map like this, you know, under like a little curtain, like when you go to a museum and you have these tribal objects and only whatever, you know, special people can look at them because, you know, you need to visually correct for stuff like this. Um, for example, here, right, this blue thing, that is due to, you know, a uh, cold lithosphere being interpreted as a density anomaly here. In this case, sort of pulling down the lithosphere. And if we were to correct for compositional effect, this would go away, right? And so there's a number of these, um, of these instances where I know that this part of the map is completely wrong, right? And so um, for the students, it might be at times frustrating, right? And you have a similar experience when you look at tomographic maps, right? Often tomographic maps don't have the same resolution everywhere. So it's very important to correct for these regional variations and, you know, by looking at you know, data-rich subsets of the maps, we can make some progress. But it's nice to um, keep sort of this mesoscale, uh, uh, these meso mesoscale processes in mind, because in the end, we want to build sort of a globally relevant model. So in terms of the test sites, I want to zoom here. I'm going to start talking a little bit about the Apennines, and then later I'm going to talk about the Atlas places that have traditionally been data rich and places that have recently become very data rich. And Pietro Sterni has a poster where he talks a little bit about the Alps, which are also very interesting. Again, a lot of you know more about the Apennines than I, which is actually not very hard because I know very little. But just sort of the, the overview, the mountain chain we're concerned about um, runs along Italy, and uh, we're going to go from the Po Plain to the northern Apennines, fairly small topography, to the central Apennines, which is the part that I think is dynamically supported right now, to the southern Apennines, and then over to Sicily. And so using um, existing data, we can then try to build a, a working model and try to distinguish the different contributions to dynamic to, to topography, be they dynamic or not. And so we start out, uh, as we have to, with a crustal model. This is a crustal thickness map that we derived based on published receiver function work. And so you can see that there's variations in moho depth, um, some large moho depth indicated by receiver functions in northern Italy. And I got a Mercator projection flipped on the side. Some relatively um, uh, shallow uh, moho underneath the highest topography, which is already indicating, oh, oh, something's out of whack, right? Because if this were isostatically compensated, we'd expect an increase. What is nice is that Italy has a very dense, continuous geodetic network, and that allowed us, in the form of Enrico Serpoloni, to actually extract the vertical rates from GPS. It's an interesting contribution. We're, we're trying to merge geological processes with geodetic observations that tell us something about the last 20 years um, and trying to, to bridge that gap somehow. And so this is now colored in terms of vertical velocities, um, subsidence here over the, uh, over the subduction down in the Tuterranean arc, some subsidence um, in the Pope Plain, and then sort of moderate uplift along main chain of the Apennines in this smoothed map, and I have um, the individual observations later. And so what we want to do is we want to go along a profile and then see what this means. Can we tie in the crustal structure with deep structure for topography? And we're going to go from the plain down here to southern Italy and then across, um, across the Tyrrhenian here. And this is the part where we have subduction, right? There's a slab that's lying down flat here, and there's some collision or some sort of remainder of subduction happening in here in the north as indicated by the seismicity. Now here's the topography that we get along this profile. We get the northern Apennines, central Apennines. This is the, the median topography along a swath, and then we move into Calabria down here. Seismicity also shown in a cross-section. And now here is what we get. If we take 
model, the one that was based on receiver functions, and convert the MOHO into an estimated iso isostatic topography, and then subtract the observed topography from that best fit area isostasy model. And that's the um, orange curve here, the yellow curve up here, and that's the residual topography. This says that given the flattening of the MOHO, the central Apennines are way out of isostatic equilibrium, assuming a constant lithosphere. Now, isostasy, you can get from crustal variations in thickness, LC here in this term, or from variations in lithospheric thickness, as Carolina already explained. Now, those two terms here, those depend on the density. Turns out that this guy here is about a factor 10 larger than this guy because crustal density with respect to asthenospheric density is a larger difference than using lithospheric density. So crustal variations are more important in terms of change in topography than lithospheric variations or flipped around. If you want to maintain isostasy, then the variations in lithospheric thickness this guy here that you need to invoke are quite large. And that is what is shown here. So that is an isostatic model saying there's nothing wrong with the Apennines, and that's the lithospheric um, thickness variations you would expect. So very dramatic here, scales of 50 kilometers uh, thinning of the lithosphere underneath the central Apennines. And Zorg, for example, wrote a, quite a while ago exploring those sorts of contributions to residual topography. And so what the here are, those are now receiver function picks for the LAB. That's something that's a little bit harder to do than uh, defining MOHO based on receiver functions. Um, but complexities aside, what the receiver functions indicate is that the lithosphere has some complexities here, but really does not see necessarily the variations that would be needed to explain the Apennine topography based on lithospheric thickness variations alone. So we think it's an unlikely scenario. So what about a mantle contribution? If we take the seismic tomography model that I showed you earlier from Piramalo and Morelli, drive mantle flow, then here's the curve of dynamic topography variations we get. And so these things are very sensitive to assumptions on how you do the density scaling, as Carolina showed. But in general, we have positive dynamic topography, some hot anomaly pushing things up in the central Apennines. And so this is here in cross-section what you see. And as is also reflected in more recent topography, what's going on is that there's a little bit of a slab attached to the northern Apennines. There's clearly a ponding slab attached to Calabria. But in the middle, there's this hole where we might have had a slab previously, but that is now detached from the surface, and we form this gap. And so that's interesting. So there's a positive residual topography signal based on the crust, based on mantle flow computations, and here is now the geodetic signal. This, this, those are the vertical rates here in green, uplift from geodesy, corrected by two different ice load models from glacial isostatic adjustments. So there's a, there's a problem here, right? We had glaciations, so we need, to tr we need to remove this signal. What this does is it means uplift is relatively larger. But in general, um, just focusing on the sign, it is positive over the central Apennines, and it's of order you know, maybe 0.2 to maybe a millimeter or so per year uplift. So three, um, three contributions going in the same direction. This indicates to us that the present-day topography is perhaps dynamically supported by a mantle process. The GPS matches the dynamic topography signal, and that's interesting, and that motivates to move beyond just looking at the sign, but also look at the rates that are implied and see if we can distinguish the processes that contribute to the rates, so the temporal change of topography, rather than the topography itself. The rates are, are nice because they're more diagnostic. If you're uh, trying to estimate this mantle contribution, this dynamic topography, then the steady topography is just sensitive to the density anomaly, but the change is sensitive to the density anomaly squared divided by viscosity. So that's nice. If you knew the two, you could say something about mantle rheology, as we heard before. It's also sort of an iffy thing to do, because really, we don't know either. But um, in terms of what we're trying to then explain, we also have more contributions to the change in topography. And those are um, spelled out here in terms of rock uplift. So we got a tectonic signal 
as the temporal change in the crustal thickness, we have some sort of metal dynamic or tectonic process changing the lithospheric thickness. We have erosion to worry about. This term comes in right by the, you know, this pulling out effect you get isostatically. We got sedimentation, uh, the sediment density going in here, and we got the mantle contribution. So let's see what, what we can do about this. Well, we've, we've looked um, along the Apennines, this being Claudio and Sean, and um, we've come up with some sort of estimates of erosional changes, all right? So these erosional changes are fractions of a, of a millimeter. We have no real control in the lith lithosphere, but we can try to get at the tectonics. We got about um, you know, a tenth of a millimeter shortening in northern Apennines. We got about you know, minus, we got extension, um, 0.2 millimeters. And so we can try to get at these contributions and combined with a, with a geodetically measured rate, we find that you know, this would be broadly consistent with a change in topography due to mental contributions of about 0.2 millimeters per year, believe it or not, maybe not. But what this means is that the dynamic topography we see of about 400 meters or so, right, we can divide these two numbers, would be built if this is an ongoing process in the last two million years. And that's interesting because that's consistent with geological constraints. And so what we think is happening um, which is not entirely new, but which we think is worth trying to quantify, is that starting you know, about 2 MA ago, we have a rather coherent um, slab that's sitting here along Italy, right? There's the boot sitting down here. And then over time, we get detachment of slab material. There's just no more oceanic lithosphere left. And we get inflow of relatively hot material so that right now, we get the slab attached to Calabria and attached to the than Apennines. And so the uplift then you can think of as something being caused by a hot anomaly in the middle, or you can think about the relative contribution that the central Apennines are just not as pulled down anymore as the north and the south are. And so this slab gap then that would explain the uplift of the central Apennines it's one of, one of those examples of having oceanic lithosphere interact with a continental lithosphere, and it would be consistent with building the Apennines over the last two million years or so, which is interesting, and it's consistent with a range of uh, earlier work. And it would be one example where steady-state topography, an assumption that's often made in geomorphology, would not work, right? Steady-state topography assumes a mountain is in balance, where any sort of uplift is balanced by erosion here, where it's have something that's clearly not steady-state, would allow us to probe some of those processes, such as the strength of the slab. It's kind of interesting. And so um, moving on to the other example is the Atlas. Atlas is a, is a mountain range that sits here in Morocco. Uh, we are over here right now and has this um, interesting alignment with the Canaries hotspot, which is down here. We got this sort of, this, this fall, this structure going all the way over to Algeria. And it's again, fairly high topography with fairly little um, tectonic changes, very little shortening. And it's also a region where the crust is, was known to be relatively shallow and um, indicating that the atlas are not compensated. We have relatively little constraints on erosion there and erosion rates, um, but it's also an interesting orogeny because it sits within the plate, right? The major plate boundary with some complexities is up here, so something is making these mountains within a continental plate, perhaps because of these effects of memory that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Atlas Mountains were identified as a place that is, that is, dynamically, that, that is dynamically generated by means of edge-driven convection or lithospheric removal earlier, a range of studies. Here's just one example um, by Folia and others interpreting the data that was available at the time in terms of an anomaly in the mantle, um, making the case that something has to be hot to push up the Atlas Mountains. Now, over the last couple of years, partially thanks to the Topo Euro Initiative and in particular Topo Iberia, we've learned a lot more about the structure of the Atlas Mountains. And I was part of an American collaboration called Picasso, which is shown here. Uh, we had 80 broadbands out. We also used a bunch of stations from Tina Thomas and uh, from the James Wookie. And um, our USC stations were over here. Here's uh, one of the stations 
uh, deployed in the Atlas. He's one of the stations deployed in the, in the south, in the Sahara. And um, you know, while the general focus was the um, tectonics of the Alboran and what's going on there, I'm going to be focusing on the Atlas. And I think you're going to hear more about the Alboran domain and what's happening up there later in the session. And so and the general setting can be illustrated in a number of ways. Uh, one way of getting at what the mantle does to the lithosphere is to look at seismic anisotropy. Um, an indication of shear in mantle flow, perhaps. Here's work by Diaz and Gallard very recently compiling the topo Iberia and our results and indicating that there's this anomaly that was earlier imaged by Wim Spuckman, perhaps causing this toroidal flow around a slab. That's something my student Lisa Alpert modeled, and we, we agree with this view. Um, here's, a, here's a forward model, but I don't want to focus on the effect of the slab um, mainly right now. I want to briefly divert and look at those observations of shear wave splitting that go across the atlas. Those are kind of interesting because, as indicated here in these orange symbols along a profile going from, the north, to, from north to south, we have this increase in delay times strength of anisotopy when we cross topography, which is shown here um, in the background, uh, smoothed, and in terms of contours, in terms of some sort of residual topography. And we got alignment of the fast axis with a trend of topography. And the really neat thing was that during the deployment, we had a deep earthquake under Spain in 2010, which allowed us to do some s analysis that we could not have done based on teleseismic phases. For one, we looked at the local delay times, which are shown here based on S arrivals. And those seem to co-vary with the teleseismic arrivals. And this led us to identify this particular signal as being due to some shear flow in the mantle going kind of like this in a region that was imaged tomographically to be relatively slow. So some sort of channel flow underneath the atlas. What's also nice is that if we look at the MOHO picks or the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary picks from S receiver functions along the same profile, we see a number of things. One, we see this increase in MOHO depth in the south that is mirrored by an increase in the LAB depth. Now, receiver functions, you know, are also called deceiver functions, sometimes for good reason. And so there's a number of uncertainties of these, many of which I'm aware of, many of which I'm surely ignorant of. But when you see LAB and more variations like this going together, that's pretty impressive in terms of the, um, the strength of the signal. There's also sort of some, some weirdness going on in the north, which seems to indicate that the general structure, perhaps of the LAB, is something like that, where we have a thinned lithosphere. And then perhaps there's an indication the crust um, has offsets that correspond to the LAB, but certainly the crust is not thickened, right? So we are confirming previous suggestions that the moho underneath the atlas is relatively flat, which is interesting, right? Because you have a mountain on top. So this means, given the small amount of convergence that has happened, the moho has to have started out thin to be at relatively normal levels right now. But this seems to indicate that there's this zone of weakness how long? A few minutes. A few minutes, OK. <laughs> All right, everything's cool. Um, um, that there's this zone of weakness, perhaps associated with a pre-existing um, suture, right? um, with, a, with a failed rift structure that we had there. And it also means that the Atlas Mountains is dynamically supported. And the variation here in LAB thickness is, again, not enough to explain the residual of the, of the atlas. Now, there's ongoing work trying to refine the map of the lithospheric structure that we may infer from receiver functions. Here's an example from work by the Münster Group that is now in the anti-atlas southwest to the line that I showed, where the colors are LAB depth. And there seems to be a fairly shallow LAB with some indication that there is a shallow channel in between a range a thicker lithosphere, perhaps um, aligned with the with the strike of the anti atlas, and we're also doing um, further processing at USC. Now, it's been it's been an interesting place to work because of the efforts of Topo Iberia and of Picasso, and the last year alone has seen 
a number of studies trying to get a tomographic structure and trying to get an active source measures of really trying to understand what the crust is doing. Just briefly, this is from a line done in collaboration between the Spanish and the US team. And the results here are broadly consistent with what we find from SIVA functions. If we look at um, S uh, wave tomography from surface wave, P wave tomography from body waves, and P wave tomography recently done by Husnelay's group from finite frequency inversions, we see some corresponding features of red stuff underneath the atlas that is perhaps consistent with what we inferred based on our line, but these tomographic models do look quite different. So this is another example for if you really got to know what to look at and what not to look at. And so what we've done recently, led by Darian Sun, is to look at waveforms, again exploiting the deep event under Granada or under Spain, the one that is indicated up here. And that's a technique that sort of was pioneered by Caltech. Song and Hamburger did work. Um, on this, for example, where you can take an existing tomographic model and try to refine it and try to really get at those anomalies that you care about in a way that you cannot do really if you do a typical tomographic technique, even with finite frequency um, approaches. And so what we've done is we use this one event as a source. We have recordings of the tangential component of the seismogram, again, going across the atlas. And we can then do um, 2D and trying to fit not just the arrival times of these waveforms, but the shape of the waveforms and the secondary arrival we get for those central atlas stations. We can then play around with different geometries, different velocity anomalies. The model fit is shown here for time and the distance in between the arrival of the secondary pulse and the first pulse. And we can then try to get at the numbers we actually care about, such as the temperature anomaly of this body that's causing modifications in the wave trains. Here's a Monte Carlo simulation assuming a dry mantle. For the typical temperature anomalies, we need to fit um, the S and the P anomalies. And so we think we can detect something that corresponds to a 350K anomaly, perhaps with some partial melt, even though there are models without partial melt that fit the data. And we think that this body that we're imaging is sitting underneath sort of the, the northern part of the atlas and looks something like that, profile going from north to south. And what we then did is we put this thing in a very simple convection computation to see do the predictions between the dynamic and the residual topography match. And here is, um, is residual in red using the source information. So we're quite confident in this. Black is the prediction from the flow model. Those dashed lines here indicate part of the domain that we are just not sampling with the ray path coverage, so we're not really sure how far this anomaly extends. And if we allow it to extend a little bit further, we get a fairly nice match suggesting that this story about support is actually quantitatively consistent. We're not out of whack in terms of the anomalies, and this thing is 350K uh, hotter than the surrounding mantle. So um, what we think is happening is what's been suggested before is that we have inflow from the plume, the canary plume, delamination um, somehow associated with slab rollback. And we now have this situation where the atlas is being supported in a manner very similar to what Duggan suggested. And so um, in closing, I was going to compare those different sides. But given that I ran out of time, I'll leave you with this slide, which is the state of my mind when I think about topography. So thank you. Thanks very much, Austin. Questions? No. Yes. So uh, the results that you show and your team has published doesn't really um, differ much from the results from Fouillet at all. Only that fully at all didn't have the data, so they were just sort of making yes, it up. Exactly, exactly. You confirm by data uh, that the model by Fouilletol. So the thing is that the, the Fouilletol paper doesn't uh, uh, invoke uh, dynamic topography at all. It's all compensated uh, by, by, by the distribution locally, let's say. Okay. 
although we, 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 we have into account also flexure. So my question is, what is really, uh, because in principle you can fit the, the, the topography always with reasonable density distribution in the crust and the lithospheric mantle, and if you, if you want, you can go deeper into 410 kilometers depth. Okay, then when I say reasonably, I mean within the, 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 the uncertainty range of available data, right? So my question is, and also affects the, the, the previous talk by Carolina, what is the evidence actually for dynamic topography? How you can confirm that you have dynamic topography? Yeah. Uh, so it is very much a game of reducing the uncertainties. And in both cases, we think that the constraints we get from seismology are such that the lithospheric thickness variations you would need to invoke here to get no dynamic topography are larger than what the seismic data indicates. That's my answer. And I would make the same argument for the Apennines, where you know, the curve to look at is um, this one here, right? This is exactly what you were, what you were inferring for the atlas. If, if the lithosphere has this sort of variation, then there's no residual, there's no contribution from the mantle needed, then there's no anomaly. Now, I think for the Apennines, the case is less clear than for the atlas, in that, I mean, is, I mean, I don't know what this means, right? There's, there's two arrivals in the LAB, we get a plate converging, so I, I'm less confident in ruling out that something like that, perhaps adjusted by density variations, could provide a sufficient explanation. That then does not explain, you know, the geodetic signal, which shows us uplift at the present day, because that seems to be larger than what you could get from erosion. So I think, and that was the point that I skipped in the end, when we, when we consider these settings and we want to understand the contributions, then it's important to not just look at topography itself, but look at uplift rates, and then see if the signs match, and see if we get a consistent story. You know? And so um, this is, you know, the case here, that would be the case for the aptus, where we have dynamic topography showing up by interpreting seismic tomography, residual topography going up, uplift rates perhaps going up. And um, here's the central Apennines, where again, everything sort of goes in the same direction. So I think your, your point is very well taken. And so going, coming back to the Folia paper, then what, what I would say is that the lithospheric thickness variations that need, would need to be invoked are not consistent with the seismological structure. Could I, could I, could I just uh, answer that? I, Manel is absolutely right. It all depends on what depth of compensation you assume for the isostasy. If you compensate at the core mantle boundary, you can explain everything and maybe beyond, right? The question is how deep do you think that's reasonable given what participates in convection? And so is 400 kilometers reasonable? It's 350, it's 250. It depends on what the mechanical properties are and what participates in convection and where not. So what is the evidence of dynamic topography? Is that, you know, perhaps preconceptions, but that it's hard to believe given temperatures and viscosity structure that anything deeper than 250 except, you know, below cratons might participate in convection, in which case you really can't have really deep I'm not discussing at all uh, about uh, convection. Convection must be and probably is. The problem is how convection translates in the surface because it depends on the rheological stratification of the crust and the lithospheric uh, mantle, etc. Absolutely, absolutely right, yes. Uh, it's, uh, but radial stresses go through rheological boundaries much more efficiently than shear stresses. That's what he said, sorry. Jeroen. Okay, so we are. Uh, okay, Jeroen, one last question. Quick Very one. Quick. Um, how, how difficult is it to, uh, to determine the, the, the effect so it's a kind of an isostatic effect of, of uh, mental lithosphere depletion because it's something that's really hard to, to constrain. And, and I think it can be a significant density effect that, that I haven't heard so far has been, been added to the... To the to maybe, maybe it's in there, I don't know, but, but if, if it is in there, it how difficult is it to It would be in this F2 estimate? factor. And so the F2 factor, you need to... 
have quite large changes to make this be a big effect. So well, crustal but the lithosphere is quite thick. The, the mental lithosphere is quite thick. So even though the density changes might be relatively small, you, you, you are adding up over perhaps 100 kilometers of mental lithosphere, which, which, which is significantly thicker than crustal thickness. Okay.